<laughs> okay, so we were learning uh, last week Siman Dalid. I just what I did here was I combined the entire pa- two pages into one page, as you can see in front of you, and we were on uh, Siman Dalid uh, Saif Kaf, which is at the in the if you look at the uh, right side of the page that you guys have in front of you, it's the second column. On the very top where it says Saif Kaf. Now remember, Simanim and Saifim is what we have in Shulchan Aruch. So we're in Siman Dalit, we're in Saif Kaf, because we are learning the halachot of Nitzilat Yadayim, of the morning. Hmm? Yeah, so yeah, exactly. Yeah, so we, it's talking about Nitzilat Yadayim in the morning. And uh, we went through the various circumstances where one has to wash his hands, many cases where uh, there's a doubt as to whether the hands need to be washed or not, and we have to wash without a baracha because we're not sure if it's required or not. That was a lot of the, uh, a lot of the deal. We also had to balance the various different reasons given for washing hands when one applies and one doesn't. So basically the solution is always wash but without a baracha. Whenever one of the reasons applies, but another doesn't. And since in some of the cases we weren't exactly sure what the parameters were of the reason, for, exi- for instance, if you sleep, but it's not nighttime, is it the same as sleeping at nighttime? If you stay up all night, is, the, is, is nighttime automatically a source of tum'ah, even if you didn't sleep? So all of these issues were played out in the earlier seifim, so please consult with the recording if you missed it. Now, Seif Kaf says, Haruchetz panav velo nigivam yafeh. If a person washes their face, now this is called medical advice. This is for, for uh, maybe, um, what do you call it? What's the, uh, uh, the name of that company that does the facial, the makeup? Avon. Avon, yeah. This is Avon uh, advice. If you wash your face, but you don't dry your face, you're going to break out. Now, why is this a halacha? I don't know. He's telling you halacha, health, health, the information. Yeah, but it's yeah. also Rambam in, in, in yeah, health, the right? Hilchot right? Hilchot 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 right? So it's not a halacha, a technical type of halacha. But he's telling you, you should take care of your hygiene. Oh, Oleb and Shechin, or you're going to get boils. If you get this, wash your face with beet water. Apparently, that was something that would cure acne or whatever. Would you would break out? I think it's probably you know if you have too much moisture on your face, it is true that uh, that can cause uh, breakouts and, and things like that. So if kaf. Uh, to, number 21 so what he says is a person should be careful when they're eating or when they are praying that they shouldn't touch uh, their thigh or parts of their body that are generally covered because these are sweaty areas of the body basically areas of the body that are sweaty under your arms uh, different parts of the body where sweat collects you shouldn't touch them. You shouldn't scratch your head uh, while you're eating or praying. But to touch your face or your head or your arms in areas that are normally uncovered, that's okay. So the point is that when you wash these places, if you, if you touch rather these places, if you scratch your head, if you touch under your arms, if you touch one of these places, which is called the makom mechuseh, a place that's normally covered, so then one should wash their hands again. That doesn't mean that they have to say a barakha when they wash their hands, but if you're in the middle of praying and you've scratched your head a lot, we assume that your hands become dirty from that. You should wash your hands again. If you're going to pray, you should wash your hands um, if you've done that. Now we get to, if you don't have water, then you should wipe your hands with anything that will clean them. So he gives us an example, rocks or dust. In other words, dust, we don't generally think of dust as being clean to begin with, but the idea is that if there's stuff stuck to your hands, if there's uh, residue of food on your hands or anything like that, so it's coarse. Anything coarse will actually, if you rub anything coarse on your hands, it will clean that off. Like sand. Like sand, yeah. Sand works to do that. So he says you can do that if you don't have water. Uvivarech al nikiyut yadaim. So let, remember, we learned in the beginning of Hilchot Netilat Yadaim that if a person is so far from the uh, so so far from water that he would have to walk an hour or more than an hour to get to the water, or he would have to walk in the opposite direction that he's traveling. 
a, you know, an amount of uh, a meal. So then we would, we said last time that was in the halacha, that was at the very beginning of Halakot Nefilat Yadayim. Then in those cases, a person is exempt from um, from the Tilat Yadayim. That was the halacha that we learned, where he said. Um, That uh, where was that that he said that? Rambam. No, it was here too, wasn't it? Wasn't it also in the Shulchan Aruch that he mentioned I the distance? I remember the specific yeah. Being oh, that was on the Rambam. Okay, could be. I could be remembered wrong. Okay, directions. so that was in the Rambam. Okay, so the Rambam was the one that mentioned the distances. So the point is that if it's a if there's a significant distance that you have to travel, or if the person either in the wrong direction, right? We said either if you have to go back in the wrong direction, even 15 minutes in the wrong direction, or if you have to go forward like an hour to get to water. So then, and those are approximate values, but basically the point is you would, uh, in that case, be exempt from washing your hands before tefillah. Instead, you use whatever's around to wipe your hands uh, in order to clean them as best you can without water. And, and you would say in that case, according to Shulchan Aruch, instead of on washing the hands, you would say on cleaning the hands. Because you're not, nitilat yadayim means pouring water over the hands. So if you're not pouring water over your hands, you can't say nitilat yadayim. But you are cleaning your hands. So you're not doing the process, but you're getting some result of cleaning your hands. So you say nitilat yadayim. But you would say You would say it, yes. You're saying, you say the bracha, but you say nitilat yadayim. Instead of al and this is good enough for tefillah. But remember, there's that other reason that you need to wash, which is the ruach ra'ad, that there's some kind of germs or whatever it is that adheres to the hands. That won't be removed by wiping them with rocks. Okay, so you have enough cleanliness that you can do tefillah, but if you come upon water later, the point is, in other words, you might think to yourself, oh, I, I prayed, I, I wiped my hands with the rocks or with sand, and now I, because there was no water, so now I prayed, I'm in the middle of the desert, I don't have water, so I, I, I used sand. So now when I get home, I don't have to wash my hands, because I said, al nikiyut yadayim, and I, I, I did that. And I'm good. So he says, no, you still have to uh, wash your hands when you get home because it doesn't satisfy the requirement of removing the Ruach Ra'ah from the hands. And then he says, So he says that that washing your hands is actually only required for Kriyat Shema and Tefillah. But birchot ashachar, the morning birchot, you can actually say, even without doing netilat yadayim. Uh, he says, unless you sleep without clothes on. If a person sleeps completely naked, so then he has to be concerned that he's touched covered parts of his body in the middle of the night. And then he would have to wash his hands even to say the name of God at all. So then he wouldn't be able to say Hashem's name at all if you sleep naked or you sleep next to somebody who's naked. So then in the morning you have to wash your hands before you say Hashem's name. But if you had pajamas on or a t-shirt or you, know, you were covered, so you, you had underwear on, you, know, you weren't completely naked. So then when you wake up in the morning, we don't assume that you've touched any place that prevents you from saying God's name. You can say Berachot. In fact, in the Gemara, when it describes Berachot HaShachar, what does it say? When he wakes up, he says, Elohai Nishama. And he says, Baruch HaNoten Nesachvivina. And when, he sits, and when he opens his eyes, he says, Pokeach Ivrim. And when he sits up in bed, he says, Matir Asurim. When he stands up, he says, Zokev Kifufim. So all the Berachot that you say, all the Birchot HaShachar were supposed to be said when you woke up in the morning before anything. Before you even opened the sea door, before you're out of bed, you're already saying Birchot HaShachar. You have a kippah right next to your bed, you know, you put it on, and you say the Birchot if you're a boy. You know, you don't need a kippah if you're a girl. Um, the point is that all these Birchot could be said even without washing hands. Washing hands is only an absolute requirement for Kriyat Shema and the Amidah. But anything prior to that, it's sufficient that you didn't touch yourself in a covered place or in, a, in, in your, uh, you, that you were dressed basically at some level. You weren't nude when you were sleeping. So, and most people don't sleep naked today. So here's my question. So in our, in our seder of the, in our seder of the, in our order of the Birkot uh, HaShachad, we get up and we say them all. But we like get up first. And even if you're right. in our seder, well our seder, in our seder, 
um, you get up, you know, you go to the bathroom and, and you do the tefillah, you do the you do the asher yatsa, you do the only thing you do before you <coughs> get to modani. Modani, right. Is that a new thing? We're going to see. The Shulchan Aruch is going to mention it later. Okay. He's going to come to it later. Okay. So we will see it. But the but in the Gemara, the point is that from the Talmud's description, clearly right, the right. way that they did it then right. was when you were waking up. So we can't be more religious when did, than the wait, Talmud. So my question is, I'm just curious when it changed. But. Well, we I, I can't say I know definitively, but definitely by the times of the Rambam, He's already mentioning people who get up and say all the brachot in synagogue and don't say them when they. He tells you the Rambam says, "Oh, when you open your eyes, you're supposed to say Baruch Ata Hashem Elokeinu Melech Haolam Bokeh Chivrim." When you sit up, you're supposed to say Matzir Asurim. When you stand up, right, right, right. it's okay. For me. He says to do it that way, like the Talmud says. But he mentions there are many people who come to the synagogue and they say all the brachot. So obviously there were a lot of the custom already existed in his time, but he thought it was erroneous. Right. And now the Shulchan Aruch is going to tell you uh, it's okay. But we are, well, to, to see we'll see. Synagogue. Yeah, to wait okay. to get to, to wait till you to wait till you get yeah. to the seat. In other words, say them all together as right. an order. The Ashkenazim, the regular Ashkenazim, not they not, say it in the synagogue. They say it in the synagogue. Right. That, that, they, that means they they don't say it in the. They don't you can only say it right. once. Right. So they get yeah. wait till they get to the synagogue and they say it in the synagogue. Yeah, but the right. Rambam also said, Rabbi, if you don't do the action, you don't do the. Right. 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 So does Shulchan right. Aruch say that? You're going to see. Right. He says it too. Right. Yeah. So we don't put the sword when we say. If you don't hear, yeah. if you don't hear uh, a cockadoodle do uh, t- in the morning, then he would say, you don't say Hanotein the Sechvi Vina Lav Kenei Which nobody does. Do you give me Which nobody does. to carry a sword with me at all times? Yeah, like, no, no, any type of. It can be a belt. It doesn't have to be a sword. No, that's just for a belt. Any belt. Any belt. Any belt. Any belt. I thought it was with a sword too, because. What is that? Has that cool halacha on never walking with a. Oh, sorry, that's Shabbat. Yeah. And the, on the street, you always have to have uh, the. No, don't worry. Over on your right, because you pull this. <laughs> no. So. So the um, so anyway so that's the point is that he makes the point that you can say barachot of any sort unless you're doing kriyat shema or tefillah you can say barachot before you before you wash your hands as long as you didn't sleep naked so we know you didn't touch any of your private parts so therefore your hands are clean enough sufficiently clean not for tefillah because for tefillah you need to have them you have to have them specially cleansed for tefillah you could say but for barachot just to say God's name just like if you if you come to uh, you stop at a co- coffee shop. And you uh, order a cup of coffee. You have to say shakol on the coffee. You don't say, excuse me, do you have a cup for netilat yadayim? Because I can't say God's name. But that, you, you don't have to wash your hands every time you say God's name, do you? I don't know if I told you the story that I once worked for a rabbi years and years ago. who um, He told me a story that he was on an airplane. And he was sitting next to a Hasidic guy. I think I told you this before. Uh, he's, he's, he's sitting next to a very pious Hasidic uh, person and they were talking and at some point he said to him who is your Rebbe that you follow you're a, great, you're a Hasid but who's your Rebbe he said I can't say my Rebbe's name without washing my hands and going. <laughs> I can't even say his name he said you just, ate the, you just ate your meal did you wash your hands before you said Hashem's name Oh, see that? Now you don't have to, but the point is, you know, don't 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 mix up your priorities. So, so you don't you don't have to you don't have to wash your hands before you say Hashem's name. That's the point. Not every mention of Hashem's name requires you to wash your hands before. Otherwise, every time you said any kind of baracha, you'd be washing your hands, and that's not the case. Maybe not referring to our Rebbe, right? Yeah, no, that's you don't need to at all. It depends who your Rebbe is. Sometimes you should wash your hands after you say it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends. Okay, now, see, uh, we're not going to go into that for sure. Siman, hey. F- uh, okay, so now we're on Siman number five, which is a very short one. It's so short that the Bit Yosef doesn't say anything about it in the tour. He just says, this is all obvious. And this is Kavanat Aberachot. So we learned everything we need to know about Netilat Yadayim in the morning. We're going to come back to more halachot of Netilat Yadayim later on in the Shulchan Aruch. But right now, that's all we need to know for the morning Netilat Yadayim. Um, now we come to Kavanata Berachot. What Kavana, what concentration or what intention does one have to have when they say Berachot? So this is very important actually because it applies every time you say Berachot. It says, When a person says a Beracha, he should have in mind the meaning of the words. Now that should be obvious. That's what the Beit Yosef in his commentary on the tour says. This should be obvious. So then you have an interesting thing when you say God's name. Because we say Baruch Atah Hashem and we pronounce the name of Hashem Adonai. But the way that Hashem's name is written is Yud and He and Vav and He. It's not written as Aleph, Dalid, Vav, Nun, Yud. That's not how it's written. So which one are we referring to? When we say Barachot, we would never, we don't pronounce that name. It starts with the, the four letter name of Hashem, we never pronounce. So, which kavanah are we supposed to have for how it's written 
or for how we say it? That's a, it's a good question. So what the Shulchan Aruch says is, Kishi Azkir Hashem, when you say God's name, Yechaven Perush Kriyato Be'adnut, you should think about the way that you pronounce it, which is God is the master of the world. Adonai means master. Shehu Adonakol, he's the master of everything. Vichaven Bechtivato, but you should also think about the meaning of God's name, the way it's written. Biyud Hey Shaya Vehoveve Yihye. Because what is the name Yud and He and Vav and He? What does it refer to? Haya, Hove, Ve He was, He is, and He always will be. That's why in the old Chumashim, how did they translate the name Hashem? The four letter name of Hashem? The Eternal One. You ever noticed that? I think in the Desolda Pool. Did it have that? I don't remember. But in a lot of old Chumashim, the Eternal One, because it means Haya, Hove, Ve Eternal One. Okay, so that's so he says when you say the name of God, really there are two ideas in there. There's the idea of how it's written. The way that it's written is to refer to was, is, and always will be, the eternity of God. And the way that we pronounce it, Adonai, means that God is the master of the universe. So one is really, so to speak, this is, uh, I'm speaking, um, you know, non literally here, but you're speaking about, so to speak, God's nature. Okay, it's hard to say that, but uh, you know, you're speaking about God's being, the nature of God's being, that He's eternal, the way that it's written, He was, He is, and He will always be. Uh, and you're also speaking about God's relationship to the to the world, because you're saying He's the Adon Hakol, He's the master of everything, Adon Olam. Okay, so that's so the idea that God is the is the master. Is, in, is the way that we pronounce it. But the fact that God is eternal, we never pronounce, which it should be very instructive to you when you think about it that way. The fact that we never pronounce that four-letter name of God is because we can't relate to God himself. The only name that's really truly God's name, that really truly reflects who God is, so to speak, is that four-letter name that we never say. That's why it's only said on Yom Kippur by the Kohen Gadol, you know, during the, during the service of Yom Kippur. It's never otherwise uh, pronounced because it reflects an idea about God that we really can't fully grasp. Um, and that's why, but, but we should still have the idea in our minds to the level that we do understand it when we say that. So when we say Shema Yisrael, we don't say Yudke Vavke, we don't pronounce the, the, the four-letter name of God, but we should be thinking of that idea as well as the idea that God is the master of everything. And then Uvhaskiro Elohim, and what's the other name of God that we use in Barachot? It's Eloheinu or Elohim, that, which is accurately translated, it just means God. Okay, so what does it mean though? What that means is that he is strong. The master, Bala Yecholet means omnipotent. He has infinite power. And Bala Kochot Kulam, what? Master of power. Hayecholet means, means Yechol, like, like capable. Can. Capable. Yeah. Master right? of capable. So, right, so we would, we would call that in English the one, wor- the one word we have for Bala Yecholet is omnipotent, right? All, all capable. And, uh, and Bala Kochot Kulam means the master of all forces. So whatever forces you see in the world, uh, God is in control of them. And that's why it's in the plural, Elohim is in the plural, because it means he's the master of all forces. And Elohim can also sometimes not be a divine name, but can refer even to other gods, are called Elohim sometimes. Of course, that's being used in a mundane way. You have to know the context. Elohim can be referring to God. It means God, so it can refer to... It can also refer to judges. Yeah, anyone who's powerful. Bnei Elim. Havul Hashem Bnei Elim. Bnei Elim means sons of the mighty ones. El or Elohim means mighty or powerful. So when we say, blessed are you Hashem, so in the word Hashem we have two meanings, because we have the name of how it's written and how it's pronounced. God is the master of the universe, and he is also... Which you could take master of the universe to mean he's the one who directs the, the ultimate purpose of the universe. And he's also the one who's eternal. And then when we say Eloheinu, we mean he's the one who is, that everything is in his control. So everything is under his control. He has the ultimate power and the omnipotence to get what he wants done. Okay, to implement as well. So these are the three ideas in the names of God that repeat in all of our brachot and we should have in mind. And basically what the Shulchan Aruch says is, that's it. That's the, whole, the entire siman, is one line. But it's important. Think about how much meaning there is in this one halacha. Because really it, it affects every bracha that you say. Now, and, and you'll notice that in many sidurim, they have like in little letters next to each word, 
what you're supposed to think of each time you say it. If you've ever looked in some of them in Hebrew, they have, you know, in tiny writing that bal and you know that, that you're supposed to think that he's the the omnipotent one when you say Eloheinu and so on. So these are ideas we should try to incorporate, but that has a lot to do with Kavanan. It's difficult to always to be ever cognizant of that. Now we come to Siman Vav. Siman Vav is Din Birkat Asher Yatsar Velohai Nishama Uperushav. Now this is a nice Siman because almost all of it is explaining a blessing that we say every day, which is the blessing of Asher Yatsar. Almost all of the Siman he spends explaining the meaning of the words in the bracha that we say after we go to the bathroom. Okay? So let's take a look at what he says. So, Sa'if Aleph. So, so far this person has gotten up in the morning, they've washed their hands, and now they have to go to the bathroom. Now, that may, you may say, well, that's the wrong order. You know, why, why, why is he mentioning it now? And also, we had the halachot about going to the bathroom back in Siman Gimel. Uh, so, why didn't he mention it then? Okay, these are all good questions. But the point is, now we're getting to Barachot, and he's telling us about Asher Yatzar. So, Asher Yatzar Tadam Bechokhmah. So when we come out of the bathroom, we say the blessing of Asher Yatzar Tadam B'Chokhmah. That Hashem fashioned, Yatzar means, bara means to create. Borei Pereya Gefen. Yatzar means to fashion something. A Yotzer could be a human being. A Yotzer is somebody who creates something with materials. Okay, so Asher Yatzar Et Adam, he formed man, B'Chokhmah, with wisdom. So Shibriyat Adam Yibu Chokhmah Nifla'ah. Why do we say this? Because the creation of man was done with great wisdom. If you study biology, you study anatomy, you find out uh, just how complex the human being is, and you appreciate that. And now he goes into some details here. He says, V'yesh mefarshim al shem she'aguf domel lenod male ruach, v'u male nekavim k'dilakaman b'samuch. He says, as I'm going to explain a little bit later, some people say, what does it mean that God created man with wisdom? But didn't he create everything with wisdom? Why don't we say, borei priya gefen bechokmah? The, the Geffen is not uh, with Chokhmah. The, everything God created is with, with wisdom. So why don't we say, She'akol uh, I mean, you could say everything in the creation is with wisdom. So why only et Adam? Why only when we say that God made man, do we say with wisdom? So he says, well, one reason is because the spirit of a person, or as he calls it, like the, the, the body is like, a, is like a, a container that holds this wind, this air inside of it. And it's full of holes, and yet the wind never comes out. In other words, we breathe in. The point is we breathe in air. And it keeps us alive. And somehow we're able to retain that air. We don't suffocate. And yet we're full of holes. It doesn't seep out. It stays in. What we need stays in. That's pretty, that's pretty nifty to be able to do that. Have you ever tried blowing a balloon that had holes in it? Have you ever tried that? Of course not. Why would you try that? <laughs> Don't tell me yes. You never tried that because you know it's not going to blow. Well, yes, now, you try to blow a balloon and you realize, and then you realize it's happening. Or when you put all the garbage in the garbage can, you realize it had a hole in it and now it's all over the floor. Now, v'yesh mefarshim, some say b'chokhmah means, it doesn't mean that God created men, b'chokhmah could mean that there's something especially wondrous about the existence of the person, namely that he's capable of taking in air into his body or taking in what he needs from his body, even though there are all kinds of holes it doesn't seep out. That's certainly true. Another way is the There's another way in which it was, a man was created in wisdom, which is that if you look at the story of creation, you'll see that the animals are created and then it mentions their mizonot, then it mentions their, uh, their uh, parnasa, what they need, what they need to, to survive. But with man, everything is already laid out. Everything is already prepared before man was created. So what does it mean, b'chokhmah? It means that everything that, that what, to, to create something with wisdom means that you're fully prepared. So everything was created and prepared in the world before human beings came on the scene. So that's what it means, b'chokhmah. It doesn't mean that there's something about human existence that's especially wise, but there's something about the way that God planned human destiny that was really wise, which was that he made sure that all the provisions were there for human beings to survive before they came on the scene. Okay? So that now we're moving. Now we're going to come back to that point later. Now, uvaravo nekavim nekavim, chalulim chalulim. And it says that God created man with, or human beings with, nekavim nekavim, many holes, halulim halulim, and many hollow organs. In other words, organs with an inside, and uh, you know that that if you open them up, there's stuff inside. Okay, that's what it means. Perush, what does it mean? Nekavim rabim, many holes. What are the holes? Kegon pe, your mouth. 
the chotem knows upita ba'at. That's the uh, that's the rectum where they where waste is eliminated. Vegambara bo evarim rabim chalulim, and we also have many organs that are that have an inside to them. In other words, they're he literally it means hollow. They're hollow, but they're not they're not hollow. I mean, there's something inside. But the point is that they you know that if you open them, you can see you can open them and see inside. And there's a there's space inside. It's Lumen. not fully hollow, but it's it's almost always called yeah. lumen. Yeah, so, kimolev, like the heart. The keres, umeayim, the intestines, the stomach. Yeah, the stomach, you open it up, it's a, it's a bag. You know, you open the intestines, it's a bag. The heart, you can open it up, you can see what's inside. Kolomar, shebanikav, so, she'im yisatem echad mehem. Then we, so what do we say in the blessing? We say, when we say, asher yatsar, we say, Hashem created man with wisdom, and he put in him lots of holes and lots of hollow organs. She'im yisatem echad mehem, that if one of them closes, or in yipatech echad mehem, or one of them opens, a person can't survive, right? So now he explains. What is im yisatem echad mehem? Kolomar, shebanikavim, yesh nekev echad. So he, he gives two explanations. So first he says that there's one hole in a person. That when he's in his mother's stomach, in his, in his mother's womb, it's closed. That's the mouth, right? If the mouth is open, you swallow uh, water. That's not good for the baby. They don't want the baby to swallow uh, amniotic fluid. So when it comes out... All of a sudden, the mouth has to open, right? Now, if it doesn't work, you're in trouble. If the mouth opens too early, that's not good. If the mouth doesn't open when the baby comes out, that's also not good. If, when he came out, his mouth didn't open, he wouldn't be able to survive. So, according to this interpretation... What it means when it says nikavim, nikavim, chalulim, chalulim is there are lots of holes in the body that if one of them closed and when it says she'im yisatem echad mehem literally he means if one of them meaning a specific one were to close meaning the mouth and you couldn't you wouldn't be able to eat or you wouldn't be able to breathe if your passageways weren't opened okay o'im yipatech echad mehem or if one of them op- if it opened when it wasn't supposed to let's say when you were in the womb it opened then you wouldn't be able to survive so, that, so literally, in other words, when you read that bracha, it could mean one of two things. Could mean that if any one of them opened or any one of them closed, we couldn't survive. Or it could mean if a specific one of those many holes were to be closed instead of open, or open instead of closed, you'd be in a lot of trouble. And which one is it? The mouth. Of course, now, once we're adults, we say, better to keep it closed. Right? But when the baby's born, it has to open. Now... So, that, that, so that's the first. These hollow organs. So in other words, he's learning it like this. That when it comes to the mouth, if it had, been, if it had stayed closed, you wouldn't have been able to survive. And when it comes to the organs, if they had opened, when the, if the heart has a hole in it, God forbid, or the stomach, or the intestine, you can't survive. So the things that are supposed to be sealed but hollow have to stay sealed. And the things that are supposed to open have to open. That's what he's saying. The od yesh lefaresh, and this is the opinion that he likes better in the Beit Yosef. She gvul yesh l'adam sheyacholi nekavav l'satem v'lo yamut. That it doesn't mean, it's not talking about specific openings. Like the mouth has to open when the baby comes out for the baby to be able to survive. That's not what it means. But it's talking about in general that there's a limit to the amount that something can be closed or open. So what does he mean? Shegvul yesh that there's a yesh ladam. There's a limit that things can be closed up and he won't die. And if you pass that that threshold, you can't survive. So for example, if you hold your nose, if somebody suffocates you, God forbid, then you, that, that's not good. Okay, if you can't, if you're, if you're not able to eliminate waste from your body, you'll also die. So things can be closed only up to a certain amount. If they stay totally closed, that's not good. There has to be a balance. The kevan shebechol anikavim hem piyata batu pihama ubechol evarim achalulim shim yebetech achad mehem yevshar litkayim hem keres umeayim shapira veshevach zem enyan asiyat rachav. And why do we say this after going to the bathroom? Because among the holes that need to either stay closed or be opened 
are the stomach and intestines, because when the food goes through, if there's a hole in the stomach or intestines, you're in a lot of trouble. And when you're eliminating waste, the hole that transports the urine out of your body or that transports the feces out of your body has to be open. Otherwise, you can't eliminate waste. So certain things have to be open enough and certain things have to be closed enough for you to be able to survive. And since the process of eliminating waste is dependent on the right things being closed and the right things being open in the right proportion... Therefore, we say this blessing about uh, organs being closed and holes being open at the, when, after we go to the bathroom. And moreover, and you could also say that, you know, if you go to the bathroom too much, it's also bad. In other words, if a person has diarrhea uh, that's excessive, it's also extremely dangerous. So not only are we worried about the closing up of certain orifices of the body being bad, constipation or not an inability to eliminate waste, but too much of it, too much of an opening of those areas is also bad. Too much elimination of waste is also a sign of sickness and is something bad. So therefore, also when you say, if they... That if one of them opens, it would be bad. Meaning if one of them opens too much... It would be bad. So when we say these things, we mean both in an absolute sense and in a relative sense. Right? That if one of the things that's supposed to be open were totally closed, that would be bad. If one of the things that's supposed to be totally closed were open, that would be bad. But then there's also certain things that should be closed to a certain extent and should be open to a certain extent. So those things, you want to have the proper balance. And that's why these barachot, about the body regulating itself properly, is what we say after we go to the bathroom. Then we say at the end, rofet, Kol basaru maflil asot, that God heals all flesh. Al shem anikavim shebara bo lohotzi psolat maachalo, ki im yit apesh ba beten yamut, vohotzato hirufwa. This is talking about getting rid of the waste from your body. That's a healing, because if the waste stays in your body, it's, gonna, it's toxic to you. So it, that's why if somebody has liver problems, you know, and they're not able to get the toxins out of the food that they, uh, that they take in, that's very, very bad. It poisons their blood. They have all kinds of problems. So, the, so eliminating the waste from your body is extremely important. That's rifu'ah. It's a healing because actually we bring dangerous stuff into our bodies that our body has to take out. That's a type of healing. And why is it wondrous? What's so wondrous about the way that, the, that our system of, uh, of going to the bathroom works. She, he says, because, because a person, as we said before, is like a pouch of, of wind. Even though we are full of wind, and we say people are full of hot air all the time, right? But we have oxygen and we have air going through us all the time. And even though we have lots of holes, it doesn't come out any of the places it's not supposed to. It stays inside. So that's a wondrous thing. He says, There's another wondrous thing about the body, and it's, which is that your body is able to sift out the ochel and remove the pisolet, which means it's able to take the nutrients from the food you eat and it knows what to get rid of. That's an amazing thing. I wouldn't even know, like, if, if, unless you're a scientist that actually knows, if I'm looking at food under a microscope, I wouldn't know which parts my body needs and which part to reject, but the body is able to actually take what it needs from food and get rid of what it doesn't need. That's actually a, a, an amazing thing. We don't realize when we're eating when we're, and when we're going to the bathroom that we're witnessing a type of miracle, that our body actually was able to identify what needed to get out and was able to send it out. It's a wondrous thing. And now the Ramah says, um, he adds, And there's another thing that's wondrous. He says that another wondrous thing is that a person is made of an, a, an unlikely combination of spiritual and physical. That we have a physical body and a, and a soul. And somehow the physical body and the soul remain united together. They remain linked together. Can you link a physical body with a soul? I don't think so. 
Nobody can do that. In fact, we don't even understand. We don't really fathom. How, does the, how is it that we're made up of a, a spiritual part and a physical part? Where's the spiritual part? You can't see it. You can't, you can't identify it. So how does it work that there's this spiritual essence that is inhering in this physical body? We don't understand. And so that's really a, a, a wondrous thing, the Ramah says. And he says that this is through the fact that he heals us. Because then the person is, when we have this combination, we have this, uh, this, this uh, what do you call it, this union of the soul and the body, then the person has a balance and he stays, that's when he's alive and he's healthy and he's functional is when he has this, this connection. Now obviously when the soul leaves the body, that's when the person is no longer with us. Okay, but as long as they're together, that is keeping the person intact. And that itself is a miracle. We don't understand how that works. We don't understand how it's accomplished. And, uh, and that's what the Ramah adds here. So now we come to Sif Bet. Yesh no, now we get back to Halachot. So now that we went through the interpretation of the Bracha, lots of ideas here to think about when you say the Bracha of Asher Yatzar. So now when we come to Sif Bet. Yesh no agin lamtin levarech al netilat gadayim ad bo'am na beta knesset. There were some people who would wash their hands at home. But they would come to synagogue and say all the barachot, including netilat yadayim, in synagogue. They didn't, not, they didn't wash their hands in synagogue. They washed their hands at home. Then they came to synagogue and said all the barachot, including netilat yadayim. It's like what the kids do in school. You know, when they sit around and they do their tefillah in school and they say, Al netilat yadayim. What's netilat yadayim? They didn't wash their hands, right? But it doesn't matter. They, hopefully they washed them in the morning. Hopefully. Um, yeah, so he says, um, He says, and they would do this with the rest of the barachot. However, he says, Uvnei sfarad lo naguken. But the Sfaradim don't do this. We wash our hands at home and, what, and say the bracha at home. We don't say the bracha in the synagogue. The Ramah comes along and says, the Ramah being the Ashkenazic voice here, he says, Val kol panim, anyway, lo bet panim. A person should never say the bracha twice. So in other words, if you said netilat yadayim at home, and then everyone's saying it in synagogue, you say, well, I don't want to be left out. I feel, I feel neglected. So I need to also say al netilat yadayim. No, no, no. Don't say it again. Only one time. We choose one minhag. So he says, If you said it at home, don't say it in synagogue. And if you decide you're going to say the bracha in synagogue and rely on that, even though that's not considered the ideal, Better to uh, not say it at home then, if you're going to say it in the synagogue. One or the other. Somebody who's going to study Torah at home before he comes to synagogue. Or he's praying before he comes to synagogue for some reason. You should do everything at home, obviously. Do the wash at home, and you can even say all the brachot at home. You have to say the brachot of the Torah if you're going to learn Torah at home in the morning before you come to synagogue, for sure. And even so, there are some people who wouldn't wash their hands. In other words, they would say the Birchot Torah, of course, if they're going to study Torah in their house, they have to say the blessings on the Torah. And they, but they wouldn't wash their hands yet. Or they would wash them, but they wouldn't say the Birchot al Tilat Yadayim. And then they would come to synagogue and say all the Birchot HaShachar, including al Tilat Yadayim. Now the Halakha is, though, according to everyone, it seems, the preferable way to do it is to do it at home. Do it Tilat Yadayim. And um, you can do the rest of the Birchot HaShachar in synagogue. That's okay if you're going to say all of them together. We're going to learn more about that when we get to the siman that deals with Birchot HaShachar. Not yet. But, the, but with regard to this issue of Al Natilat Yadayim, he's saying there were some people who waited till synagogue. You don't need to do that. Birkat Eloi Neshama. Eino potachat bivaruch. Mepnei shuhu birkat ha-hoda'a. U birkat ha-hoda'ot en potachot bivaruch. Kemo shematino bebirkat ha-gishamim. What is this talking about? The, the first blessing you say... In the morning, Elohai Nishama. After you say Asher Yatzar, Elohai Nishama Shenatata Bitaora. God, my God, the soul that you've put in me is a pure one. You created it, you formed it, you planted it in me, etc. So, a person who says that there's something unusual about the blessing of Elohai Nishama. Did you ever notice? If you didn't, if you, didn't you will now. It doesn't start with the words Baruch Atah Hashem. Do you know any other blessing that doesn't start Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokeinu Melech Haolam, something? There's no such thing. So why are you saying Elohai Nishama Shinata? Why isn't it Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech Haolam Nishama Shinata the Bitaora? Why doesn't it sound like a normal bracha? Starts with Elohai Nishama Shinata the So that's not the typical uh, thing. So it's a problem. So there were some that said. Now the only time you normally find such a thing that a bracha doesn't start with Baruch Atah Hashem is when it's called Baracha Hasimucha Lachaverta, when there are multiple brachot one after the other. So for instance, in the Amidah, what, right? The very first blessing starts, Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu, 
We don't find another. Then at the end of the brachot, we find Baruch Atah Hashem. But we say Atah Chonin Adam Datum Labedner Atah Gibor Leolam Hashem Mechayimit Imat Rav Doshia Atah Kadosh Hashem Chak Kadosh Atah Chonin Adam Daat Hashivenu Avinu. There's no Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech Haolam Hashivenu LeTorah Techa. There's no. Why? Because you started out with Baruch Atah Hashem in the beginning, or in the blessings of the Shema. We started Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech Haolam Asher Bidvaro Ma'ariv Aravim Bechokma. Right? We're about to do Arvid. You say that with Baruch Atah Hashem. Then in Ahavat Olam, do you say Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech Haolam Ahavat Olam? No, you just start Ahavat Olam. Why? Because since you already said Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech Haolam in the beginning, so there's a bracha right after that. You don't need to. In Birkat Hamazon, the first one is Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech Haolam Ha'el Azan Otanu Bet Haolam, etc. In the second one, what's the second one? No Delecha. Where's the Baruch Atah Hashem No Delecha? You don't need it. Because since you had it in the beginning... They're simuchot. They're, they're adjacent to barachot. You don't need to keep saying baruchat Hashem. So Elohai Nishama is a novelty because it doesn't seem to follow the right pattern. If it were after another barachah, we could understand. So that's why in the Sidur, what do they do? They put Asher Yatsar et Adam Chochmah and then Baruch HaTashem Rofechol Basom Afil Asot Elohai Nishama Shinatat Abit Tehorah Why? That way you make Elohai Nishama juxtaposed Samuch to the blessing of Asher Yatta. However, the Shulchan Aruch actually is saying here, you don't need to do that. He says, you know why Elohai Nishama is, doesn't start with Baruch? Because it's not an ordinary bracha, it's just a hodaa. It's a thanksgiving to God separate from any bracha. It doesn't follow the format of a bracha. And once in a while you find an anomaly of something that doesn't follow that pattern. And this is one of them. And that's what he says, like the blessing of Gishamim. There's a blessing on Gishamim, on rain, on the first rains of the season, that just starts with modim. They just start saying, we thank you God on every drop of rain that you give us, and etc., etc. There's a blessing that you say on the, on the falling of rain. It doesn't start Baruch Atah Hashem. So he's saying, just like it doesn't start Baruch Atah Hashem, Elohai Nishama doesn't start Baruch Atah Hashem. Once in a while you have an exception. To, the exception proves the rule. Okay, it's just an exception. So he's saying, you don't need to say Asher Yatzar Adam Bechokhma right before you say Elohai Nishama. You don't need to. Now in our Sidurim, it usually has it that way. It has it that way because if you're going to say all of the Barachot in, an, in order anyway, you might as well fulfill all the opinions. And since some people say that you should say Asher Yatzar and then Elohai Nishama, do it that way. But if you wanted to be more stringent and follow the Rambam and say the Barachot in the order that they happen. So when are you supposed to say Elohai Neshama? Does anybody know? Right. Right when you wake up. Right when you wake up, Elohai Neshama. So what about Asher Yatzar? Don't worry about it. So you, so you see that he doesn't want you to think that you absolutely must say Asher Yatzar before you say Elohai Neshama. You don't, there's no absolutely must. Who's, um, this is the, who's the opinion that, that you say it after Asher Yatzar? The, the Joseph is going to tell us okay. the basis for that opinion. Yeah. When you wake up, you say Hamapil. Uh, what? No, when you wash your face. Oh, no, no, when you get in bed, you say Hamapil. He says, when you get in bed, you say Hamapil. That's when you wash your hand. When you wash your face, Hamavir Chavle Shenam and I. When you wash your face, is when you say that. It says that. So, in the, uh, in the Bet Yosef, he explains that there were some who said. That you need to connect Elohai Neshama to the uh, uh, to Asher Yatzar, and I see. Uh oh, maybe it's not here. Uh oh, it's not here. But um, it's not on the handout. I want to say that it's the Rashba, but I can't remember now. I have to look back. But there's uh, he he brings an opinion, and then he he says that it's not necessary to follow it. <coughs> it's not necessary to make sure that they're together. Um. Yeah, I can't find it right now, but it's in here. Um, we'll look it up after. So, but in, in any case, he quotes a tshuva that says that you should do that, but he says it's not necessary, so you can say Elohai Neshama even without saying Asher Yatzar first. So then he says, Yesh no agim, shachar shebirech echad birkat ha-shachar, ve'anu acharav amen, chozer echad me'aonim amen, u'mevarech v'onim acharav amen, chaseder ze osin kol otam sh'anu amen, t'chila, ve'en ar'er alehem v'lomar sh'kvar yatu be'amen sh'anu t'chila. So what he says is that they used to have this custom. In order for everybody to get lots of brachot. So let's say Yaakov would come to synagogue and he would say the brachot out loud. Everyone would say, Amen. 
Baruch Adah Hashem Elokeinu Mocham Matzir Asurim. Amen. And then somebody else would come and say theirs. And then Eli would say, Baruch Adah Hashem Bokeh Chivrim. Amen. So everyone is saying theirs out loud, so everyone gets the zechut of saying amen to everyone's bracha. So he says, it's no problem, because each individual is saying their own bracha. And when I said amen to Yaakov's, I didn't mean to exempt myself. I wasn't fulfilling my obligation. I was just saying amen to his. Then I wanted to say my own. And then after I say my own, Eli was saying his. And then Sammy saying his. So you're allowed to do that. It's no problem if you didn't have in mind to fulfill the mitzvah. Because, and also the guy who's saying it doesn't mean to be motzi you. He's not trying to fulfill the mitzvah for you. Even if you were. It doesn't matter because the audience who's saying amen doesn't intend to fulfill their obligation. They're just saying amen to say amen. So it's no problem. He didn't want to fulfill your obligation and you didn't want to fulfill your obligation either. So you're allowed to go back afterwards just like anything else. If the guy says Hallel, Baruch Hashem, Asher Kiddush Ligmoreta Hallel, and you said Amen. Now you say the bracha again. He wasn't saying it for you. Or if he says Al Natilat Lulav, Amen. That doesn't mean I'm saying the bracha for you. You're still going to say your own Al Natilat Lulav even though you said Amen to mine. Only when you're in a situation where one person is actually doing it for the other person like Kiddush. Then, I intend to say the Kiddush for you, you intend to listen, or you're saying the Kiddush for me and I intend to listen. Then it works. It works that way. But if we don't intend to, and I just said Amen, don't say now I fulfilled the obligation because I said Amen to you. I didn't mean to fulfill any obligation by saying Amen. Now let's just do the... We're actually going to try to zip through this very last Siman, because I was hoping, because next week is Thanksgiving, and we won't be here. And then when we come back, we will resume with Hilchot Tzitzit, a totally new subject. Okay, so let's do this Siman Zayin, which is a Sher Yatsar. It's a very short Siman. Saif Aleph. Kol Ayom Kishoset Rachav. Any time a person goes to the bathroom, Ben Kitanim Ben Gedolim. That is not a quantitative measurement. Don't smile, Sebastian. That is a qualitative. Gedolim means elimination, and Kitanim small means urinating. Okay, it's just a euphemism. So, Mevarech Asher Yatsar, every time he goes to the bathroom, he says Asher Yatsar, velo al netilat yadayim. But he doesn't say al netilat yadayim. And the reason he's saying this is because there were some people who said that every time you go to the bathroom, when you come out, you should wash your hands, say al netilat yadayim, and then say Asher Yatsar. We don't, we don't agree with that, but he's telling you that you don't need to do that. Af im rotel el modul el palel miad. Even if you're going right to synagogue, in other words, you went to the bathroom, you came out, you want to wash your hands to, in order to pray, you still don't say al netilat yadayim. You wash your hands. You say Asher Yatsar, but you don't say Al Nitilat Yadai. Hayu Yadav Meluch Lachot. The Rama says she shif shif behen afilu achi enom varech Al Nitilat Yadai. Even if your hands were dirty from going to the bathroom, and you have to clean them, obviously, still you don't say Al Nitilat Yadai. You only say Al Nitilat Yadai on two things: in the morning and when you eat bread. That's it. There's never another time. He says, if a person, in other words, there are three levels. If the person went to the bathroom and just wants to go out back to work, he's not going to pray. So that person doesn't really have an obligation, you know, he should be sanitary and clean his hands. But he doesn't have an obligation, a halachic obligation, if his hands are clean, he doesn't have to do anything. Okay, so what the, what, the, what, the, what the Shulchan Aruch is saying here is that if the person went to the bathroom and he didn't get dirty from going to the bathroom. Okay, shif shif means he didn't touch himself in any place that he needs to uh, wa- wash his hands. So he says, even though he needs to stay a sher yatsar because he went to the bathroom, he only has to wash his hands because of nikiyut or because of hikon. Meaning, since his hands were not dirty, just because you went to the bathroom and you urinated doesn't mean you have to wash your hands if you didn't touch anything. You went and didn't touch anything. Okay, and now you want to go pray. So you want to go pray, you say, so he says, because of hikon, you have to wash your hands. Meaning you should always wash your hands before you go pray, even if they're not dirty. Or if you think you might have touched something, you should wash them because they're dirty. But there's no absolute obligation, if the, except out of sanitary reasons, just because you want to be extra careful. Unless you actually had your hands dirty, there's no obligation to wash your hands. If your hands are dirty, there's an obligation to wash your hands before you say Hashem's name. If you went to the bathroom and your hands are actually dirty. But if your hands are not dirty, then you're just doing it for sanitary reasons or for an extra measure of what's called hikon. That means you should be especially in, you know, put together when you go to pray. So even if your hands are not dirty, you should wash them if you're going just to pray. 
היטיל מים והסיח דעתו מלהטיל מים ואחר כך נמלח והטיל מים פעם אחרת צריך לברך שתי פעמים אשר יצר. This is what the Shulchan Aruch says that many disagree. He says if you went to the bathroom and you forgot to say אשר יצר. You forgot. You were coming out of the bathroom and you saw your old buddy from many years ago you started talking to him you forgot. And then you ended up going to the bathroom again. And then you realized I never said אשר יצר the first time. What am I supposed to do? So the Shulchan Aruch says, you say it twice. Once for the first time, once for the second time. Now many people disagree with this. So they, and they draw an analogy. So the Bayit Chadash, which is another commentary on the tour, asks the following question. He says, let's say a person eats a meal. And then they forget to say Berkat HaMazon. They walk away from the table, they come back, and they eat some more. And now they say, oh, I need to say Berkat HaMazon now, or I need to say my concluding Bracha now. Do they say it twice? Would you say it twice? No. No. You wouldn't. I mean, it was one eating. You, you ate food. You walked away from the table. You came back to the table. You ate some more. You say it once. Even if you forgot in between and you came back. As long as not enough, you know, not too much time passed. You forgot for 10 minutes and then you came back. So you ate some more. One Berkat. So that's different. But we're saying, like, if you didn't say Berkat Amazon in between. You don't say it twice. Even though in the middle you left the table and you forgot and then you came back and you ate some more, you still only say it once. So it says the same thing if you went to the bathroom one time. You came out. You didn't say a sher yatsar. And then you went again. And then you, you have to say it again. Why should you say it twice? So that's what the Bayit Chadash argues against the Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch is saying you should say it twice. Everybody, the short period of time is, the important, is an important factor. In what? In food? Yeah. In food, it's an important factor because if, if you're hungry again, then you can't. Then you lost the opportunity to say Berakat Amazon. Oh, okay. So yeah. would it be the same issue with bathroom? Short period of time. Okay, so you tell me the answer. What, what, how would you answer that? You're, you are the Bet Yosef. I'm promoting you. The Bayit Kadash just gave you a good question. He said, why is it any different than eating? If I eat, I go away from the table, I forgot, I come back, I eat some more. I only say Berkat Amazon once. So why if you go to the bathroom, you forgot to say the bracha, you leave, you go to the bathroom again, you have to say it twice. Well, why, why? Tell me, he says clear, there's... So what's the difference? End of the action. There's a very clear definitive end of the action. You, when you get up from the table, there's a bunch of food... But still, why can't I just have in mind for both times? It's the same bracha, I mean, why do I have to say it two times? That's a good question, right? So it's a simple answer. Actually, it's, I mean, the, the answer that I think the Beit Yosef would say is that there's a difference because in eating, it's not the act of eating that you're saying the brachan. It's the satisfaction of the person. Okay? In other words, when you're saying the bracha on eating, you're saying bracha on satisfaction. So you're, you're only satisfied once. You don't say, oh, I was satisfied. I'm, you know, I, I ate food, I left for 10 minutes, I came back and I ate food again, I need to say two brachot. Because it's one state of satisfaction. It's cumulative. It's cumulative. So of course you're only going to say one bracha because it's cumulative. Why would you say a bracha on half the meal and then the other half? It doesn't make any sense. But the bathroom use, you're saying a bracha on the fact that your body works. And that's two events, two distinct events. Two distinct occurrences. Each one is separate. There's no cumulative effect because we're not dealing with the cumulative effect of the behavior. We're dealing with the phenomenon itself that the body operates according to the way it's supposed to operate. That's what you're saying the bracha on. So if it happened twice, it's two brachot because each time it's equally miraculous. The first time was miraculous. The second time is miraculous. You're, you're, it's on the event that you're saying the bracha. Birkat HaMazon is on the person that you're satisfied. You're not half satisfied and then another half satisfied. There's no two Birkat HaMazons. So that's why the Shulchan Aruch is distinguishing between two. And at the last halacha, And she'or lashtin mayim, Ki afilu tipa achar chayv levarech. She misatem anekev milotia tipa hi, Aya kashelo v'chayav lehodot. He says that when it comes to bathroom use, there's no quantitative amount. We don't care how much or how little. Why? Because every little amount is, uh, you need to, it needs to come out. Right? In other words, if everything is, is valuable, if any of it were not able to leave the body, it would be damaging and disastrous for the body. Even a tiny bit stays in your body, it's toxic to the body. It would be very harmful, even a small amount. So therefore, we don't say quantitatively, oh, it wasn't enough, it was only this amount, or it was this amount. There's, a, there's no quantity on it, because it's the fact that the body is eliminating what it needs to eliminate that makes a difference. Whatever that quantity is, whether it be a little bit or it be a lot, the fact that it's operating uh, smoothly and effectively is what we're saying the bracha on. 
And that's the, where the Shulchan Aruch ends. And uh, we didn't get to go into the Beit Yosef too much because we wanted to uh, round this off. But basically on this, there's really no discussion in the Rambam to do. Most of what the Beit Yosef talks about here is just explaining the basis for these halachot, what the source was for these halachot, and what the different opinions are about this halachot. And since we don't need to go too far into that, I included it in the sheets for those who are interested in perusing that. But uh, otherwise, um, it wasn't necessary for understanding uh, the basic bottom line of the Shulchan. Aruch this week, and that's where we're going to conclude for this week.